we will be discussing uh, some of the considerations during pregnancy uh, for patients with, uh, with rare neuroimmunologic disorders. And so first, I just want to open it up to the panel in terms of uh, Dr. Pardo and Dr. Nicholas. Do you have any thoughts about those patients who have recurrent uh, autoimmune diseases of the CNS and the, that are on immunosuppression? How do you advise your patients who become pregnant um, in those circumstances? So I think it's really important um, that if you're planning to become pregnant and you're on a medication that is suppressing your immune system or really any medication for that matter, that you want to have a discussion with your uh, neurologist or your doctor as well as your OBGYN about the safety of being on that medication, um, especially during attempts at conception and pregnancy and, and even breastfeeding if you plan to do that, but also um, if it would be safe to come off your medication. <clears throat> it's very different depending on the disease. So for example, in multiple sclerosis, we know that pregnancy is actually protective uh, against new relapses or new disease activity in the further along in your pregnancy, the less likely it is that you would have a relapse. But actually, in recent years, we've found that with other uh, neuroimmunologic disorders, that's not always the case. So in neuromyelitis optica, we have not found that pregnancy is protective, and um, women uh, tend to have an increased risk of complications during pregnancy. And so it's hard to put it as a generalization for all neuroimmune diseases. But I think it's important that you have that discussion early. It's much better to, um, to know about your plans and help to plan along with you than to have the surprise um, pregnancy happen on a medication. Um, and uh, you know, in the case of uh, pregnancy in neuroimmunologic diseases, there's actually a lot more data being collected now. So it used to be that we really hadn't um, had much information because obviously we're not going to put pregnant women on immune suppressive therapies and then study what happens to them and their babies. Um, but anybody who has become pregnant on any of these medications, um, it is very important to have that information reported so that we can use these pregnancy registries to share what the outcomes were for women on these medications. So for instance, in neuromyelitis optica, um, there has been a lot of evidence and some that was just presented at uh, ECTRAMS, which is our large European MS meeting um, just this past week about uh, rituximab and um, the relative safety of that uh, during pregnancy. But again, these, these medications, it needs to be a discussion about risks and benefits of your disease and how to keep you safe and also how to prevent complications um, for the baby. So I, I will add uh, minor things and, and, and briefly. Actually, one, one of the conversations that I always have with women, uh, particularly when they are recently diagnosed and befa before starting the treatment, is I ask the question, are you planning to get pregnant in the next two or three years? And the reason I ask that question is because many of the medications that we use in, in immunology for, for autoimmune disorders have a period of, of, of uh, introduction. Let me say immunosuppressive medications are going to be effective uh, only s almost six months after the introduction of the medication. The same happened for other medications that we use in multiple sclerosis, for example. So one of the questions that I always ask is, if you are planning to get pregnant within a period of one or two years, actually, just do it right now, rather than starting the medication and then stopping the medication and try and try and attempt or, or going on, on pregnancy. So uh, that's a very important conversation, particularly for women that are recently diagnosed that are uh, planning to have uh, 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 babies in the near future. Uh, and Dr. Kabahug and Dr. Uh, Sadowski, in terms of rehab considerations. Is there any uh, level or degree of injury that would interfere with a patient being able to become pregnant? One quick answer, no. <laughs> so pregnancy does not, uh, pregnancy, sorry. Um, having a spinal cord dysfunction does not preclude a woman from becoming pregnant. 
um, as I talked yesterday in the session in, in the afternoon, after the initial period, like after you've had your event that has affected your spinal cord, uh, we expect that you have the return of your menses within like four to six months after that. And technically, if you're in a childbearing age, you can get pregnant. One of the things like what Dr. Nicholas and Dr. Pardis is, um, for my patients who are female who are in a childbearing age, I talk with them about, um, I start the discussion early because a lot of the changes that a person with spinal, a woman with spinal cord injury experiences, when you become pregnant, um, these changes um, are amplified. Um, sir, if you can pull up the, this, the slide. I do have one last slide for today. Um, it's, a, it's, not, it's a little bit messy, but the one on the right, the one in pink, is the changes that you could expect to see in pregnancy. You'll have, uh, again, increased weight gain, Women tend to get more UTIs. Um, as, the, as, as your uterus expands, you might find, you find it more difficult to take a deep breath. Some of them will have more joint pain. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I didn't do anything. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then in spinal cord injury, you also have these issues, again, depending on what your level is. Uh, if you're on a higher level, you might have more difficulty in um, breathing. And as you go lower, it's just going to be less issues. But they make a really interesting Venn diagram. So in the middle, all of these things, again, not my fault, all of these things would be compounded um, as a rehabilitation specialist. So we, I, I would um, discuss with the patients the changes that could potentially happen as the pregnancy progresses. If they have spasticity, then we have that in-depth um, conversation about the medications that they're on because some of these medications can um, pass through the um, maternal fetal barrier. Um, if you're going to do breastfeeding later on, there are potentials. There is a potential for it to um, uh, go to the breast, uh, to cross into the breast milk. Also, one of the things is like um, spasticity can potentially also increase um, in pregnancy. So we also have to check for triggers as I mentioned earlier in my talk, and try to address those triggers. Maybe Christina can add some more. The only thing that I'm going to add is that, uh, because I talked about bladder and recurrent urinary tract infections, and those can occur during pregnancy, and actually there is increased uh, frequency, and there are some good studies that show that prophylactic antibiotic use varying uh, two different antibiotics mm -hmm. each week throughout pregnancy um, lead to decreased incidence of UTI. So there are methods to decrease the chance of having recurrent UTI while pregnant. Go uh, ask us or your OBGYN. Are there any triggers for autonomic dysreflexia that uh, might more commonly be something you need to look out for during pregnancy? So aside from you, remember to talk earlier, bladder, bowel, and every, bladder, bowel, skin, and everything else. Same thing, same rules apply. So if it's not related to your bladder, um, anything that would irritate you can lead to autonomic dysreflexia. Number one cause would be bladder. If it's not a UTI, um, might be something else, or you might need to catheterize more often. Um, Bowels, um, you know that bowel distension and fecal impaction can trigger autonomic dysreflexia. So, when with an enlarging uterus, and and for even for those without a spinal cord injury, you know that when you're pregnant, you're you know want to go to the bathroom more frequently. Your bowels a little bit out of whack. So it's just think of that as being amplified. So that could be triggered even more. So it's very important that. Um, you, you are on top of or you modify your bladder program if you need to be catheterized or your, and, and your bowel program. Now for skin, so this is going to be a challenge as your abdomen increases and your mobility is decreased, especially if you have um, paralysis of your legs or your arms. Um, you, there, there is a possibility of increased risk of skin breakdown and pressure injury. And that, if unrecognized, can trigger autonomic dysreflexia. So those are, the, it's, again, 
think of that Venn diagram overlap and it's just a little bit, it's gonna be a bit more amplified. You just have to be uh, more on top of monitoring your regular program of care. Is, uh, I'll ask any of you who want to answer, uh, is there any reason that a woman couldn't get an epidural uh, during her labor? So absolutely not. Um, there used to be a suggestion uh, in the medical community that you could not get an epidural if you had multiple sclerosis or other neuroinflammatory diseases, but there are actually studies that disprove that. So I always write that down in my note and have my patient include it in their bag to take to the hospital because every woman has a right to an epidural if she wants one. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, so it, it should, there is no reason why you couldn't get an epidural, especially like if, as you go into labor and you're, you're, get, you're having the contractions, that could also trigger AD as much as possible. Um, we want to avoid that. So again, mm -hmm. we, we want, we it's either you get an epidural response, so there's not really a contraindication to that. And Drs. Pardo and Nicholas, for uh, a patient who has a recurrent autoimmune, rare neuroimmunologic disorder uh, of the CNS, is there, how would you handle medically, medication-wise, the labor, or, or not the labor, but post-delivery and reintroducing immunosuppressants. How, how do you do that? And are there any considerations for breastfeeding that you have? Okay, so again, it, it is really going to depend on the disease and the medication that the individual is taking. So. Um, if it is a medication that is uh, harmful to the baby um, and, we're, and the woman chooses to breastfeed, then we may use something like uh, steroids temporarily or even IVIG to um, try to prevent a recurrent attack. Um, in diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, you know, there is a medication called glutarimer acetate that we use to, that can be used safely during pregnancy and throughout uh, the period of breastfeeding. Um, again, there are more studies with uh, rituximab that are coming out that show the relative safety of that, but again, it needs to be discussed individually. Um, but I think overall, we also need to um, realize that I think one of the most important things is that uh, the woman who's had the child can actually continue to be a mom and function to the best of her ability. So sometimes if that individual is at significant risk of having recurrent attacks, perhaps we may breastfeed for a very short period of time and plan to reinitiate the therapy um, that she's on uh, sooner. But again, it's in generalizations, it's challenging to talk about if we're not looking at one specific disease. I, I don't have too much to add, except that uh, it's always important to discuss safety for the mother, safety for the baby. And again, it's uh, extremely important to go uh, and evaluate what is the burden of the disease and the risk of relapse. Because there are patients that may remain quite stable for several years, get pregnant, and there is no uh, urgency to go again on a star for a starting treatment. So again, every patient is different. So the physician, the clinician, healthcare provider should evaluate the, the different factors that may influence a potential relapse, the burden of the disease, and safety for the mother and safety for the baby. And then I'll open this out up to anybody who wants to answer. Is there anything about having any of these disorders that uh, would Im impede the ability to become pregnant? So I may go on that. So uh, actually, immunological disorders, again, have a lot of flavors. And one of the flavors in a subset of patients is autoimmunity that may impair ability to uh, uh, get successful pregnancy. Uh, when we are in the process of evaluating a patient with an autoimmune disorder, actually, frequently, we go and explore the possibility that uh, the patient may have or may harbor for example, antibodies that may impair the ability for conception or ability, uh, for pregnancy. Uh, there are uh, sort of autoimmune disorders, including lupus, and some of the ones that are 
called anticardiolipin syndrome that are frequently associated with miscarriage and is frequently associated with uh, 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 disruption of pregnancy. So uh, it's obligation of the physician and healthcare provider to do a, an assessment in women that may be at risk of having those disorders. Okay, and actually I'd like to open it up to the audience. Is there any, are there any specific questions that any audience members have uh, about related to pregnancy and autoimmune, neuroautoimmune diseases? Hello. Okay, my first question is because I just literally don't know. Does a neurologist come in the room when an epidural is given? So it's typically an anesthesiologist okay. that does the epidural. Would I need a neurologist there? Uh, no. Okay, because that's always worried me. I never knew if I could get an epidural or not. Because I don't want anything to happen again. I don't know. So. But it's extremely important that you talk with your provider and make sure that the anesthesiology that's coming to provide this, the procedure is aware about your neurological yeah. situation. Because uh, remember, in emergency settings or even when you are in the uh, uh, operating room, sometimes the, uh, there are urgency and emergencies and the anesthesiologists need to be aware about your past medical history and sometimes uh, people that are in the operating room or in the uh, uh, other settings uh, dismiss autoimmune disorders or dismiss the possibility of myelitis or other things and pay attention mostly to the main reason the patient is in the emergency situation. Okay, thank you. I'll bring up another question I had for the panel. In terms of post anesthesia, is there, have you ever seen it where patients' symptoms are affected at all as they as they come out of their anesthetic state? So, um, you know, following a, following a delivery uh, or a, um, you know, emergency cesarean section uh, can be a, a time that increases the chronic symptoms that somebody has. So it's not necessarily coming out of the anesthesia, but the stress of the operation or the fatigue of pushing to deliver a baby vaginally could certainly increase um, your fatigue, your spasticity, your pain, um, bladder issues, but then with rest, um, which hopefully would come from help and support of your loved one, since uh, having a baby is never restful after the baby's born, um, then uh, those symptoms should expect to decrease and improve. Uh, there is one thing that I have crossed a couple of times in my experiences Patients that receive epidurals and have a history of spinal cord damage associated with myelitis, the effects of epidural may last even longer. And that's some situation that generate a lot of concern because uh, some uh, patients and even some healthcare provider may confuse that situation with some potential relapse of um, uh, spinal cord problems. So, uh, again, uh, the provider need to be aware about your past medical history of spinal cord disease. I just wanted to make you aware of a resource. Um, I had two women write articles for my book. Uh, both of them were diagnosed with transverse myelitis as young teens, and they wrote about their pregnancies, their deliveries, and what their experiences were like uh, raising an infant and all of what they had to deal with. One uh, is paraplegic and the other uh, is ambulatory, but she has s significant weakness. And they're both very candid in describing bowel and bladder issues and all of what they went through in their pregnancy. Um, one of them uh, actually had four pregnancies, delivered four boys, um, and her descriptions are really uh, pretty amazing. Um, and I, it's a wonderful resource just to know, you know, people who have gone through the experience and who are willing to share it. Any other questions from the audience? How do you find a good OBGYN that can deal with, you know, the differences in your pregnancy? Uh, 
in Baltimore, we have high risk. So because we're a specialized spinal cord disease center, we have a resource. Um, we, we keep names, <laughs> take names, but the high risk OBGYN unit at your uh, university probably would be a good first choice first step, and then uh, then ask uh, Sandy, because he has resources here. <laughs> I, I just kind of wanted to, to say um, about my own experience, about the time I was being diagnosed, I found out that I was pregnant with my fourth child. Their advice to me was to abort my child because mm -hmm. they didn't feel like they could treat me um, and still keep him viable. And I refused. So they kind of had to change their plans a little bit. And But it, uh, everything, um, he was probably one of the more normal pregnancies that I had. Um, I delivered him by cesarean. Um, all the other three were cesarean as well. Um, I had a spinal anesthesia. Um, everything went well. I was hospitalized for three weeks. I don't, I don't remember what all was going on, but apparently there must have been some things that I, I, I guess I just didn't care at that point. I had a beautiful, healthy baby boy. And um, so just if I can allevi uh, alleviate any, any fears or apprehensions, um, I, I had a very good doctor. He was actually the chief of obstetrics at, um, St. Anne's Hospital here in Columbus, and um, I, I don't know, I, I'd be happy to, you know, talk to anybody if I can, if I can help, um, especially if it's your first child, not knowing what to expect in the first place. It was a beautiful experience. My, my, um, my husband actually got to be in the delivery room and I don't think he cut the cord, but he got to see the birth. <laughs> and we did Lamaze. We were the first couple uh, to go through Lamaze where the husband could come into the delivery room. So I don't know. But <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, as the pediatric nurse practitioner, I, I did want to make one comment that it's my understanding that autonomic dysreflexia is also dangerous for the baby. Um, because it causes vasoconstriction of the placenta, so it's really important that it be monitored and treated aggressively. Any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, thank you, doctors. Thank you.